All units stand three. It now appears as though shots are being fired, confirmed by the complainant. All units responding proceed with extreme caution. Nestled among lush, tree-shaded avenues and well-manicured gardens, a seemingly serene house in the tranquil town of Friendswood, Texas, became the unlikely stage for a chilling crime. The type of tragedy that has, regrettably, become an all-too-familiar narrative in American society. It began as an ordinary gathering of teenagers, a scene mirrored in countless communities nationwide. Yet, this particular evening took a harrowing turn, catapulting four young lives into a nightmarish sequence of events that would lead each of them to unexpected destinations. A hospital bed, a jail cell, and tragically, the cold stillness of an embalming table. Let's dive into the profoundly sad case of murder in Friendswood. For teenagers, the holidays may hold a special significance. As they navigate a developmental phase marked by the search for identity and the need to assert their independence, the companionship of peers becomes increasingly important. Ask most parents of teens, and they'll likely tell you that as their teenage sons and daughters grow older, they spend more time with friends and less with them. Such gatherings allow them to forge stronger connections away from the pressures of their usual academic and family responsibilities. These interactions are not just social, they are a fundamental part of their emotional and psychological growth. Yet, this pursuit of independence and peer connection can sometimes lead to unforeseen and tragic consequences. In a stark deviation from the usual festive spirit and camaraderie that defines the holiday gatherings of adolescence, we were confronted with a frightening event in Friendswood, Texas. The contrast between the expected holiday cheer and the grim reality of this violent act serves as a sobering reminder of the complex challenges facing today's adolescents. On the evening of December 23, 2023, a male guest was spending time with three teenage friends in a two-story residence located on the 1800 block of LaSalle Street in Friendswood. He went into the bathroom around 8.45 p.m. and shortly after, he heard a sound that was impossible to mistake. As soon as he heard the gunfire, the male in the restroom barricaded himself inside and used his cell phone to call 911. He told the emergency dispatcher about the two gunshots he heard coming from within the house and mentioned that there were additional people present inside the residence. Police were routed to the Mission Estates neighborhood and arrived less than two minutes later. As they approached the home, one officer observed a woman speaking with a visibly distraught teenage male seated on a street curb near the residence. The officer confronted the teen and asked if anyone was hurt. The boy nodded his head, held up two fingers, and said, There's two teenagers inside. I think they're dead. The officer quickly entered the residence through the front door and located the emergency caller still hiding in the bathroom. According to the caller, after the gunshots, he heard the suspected shooter walk by the bathroom door, crying, and in a moment of sudden realization or shock at his own actions, stated, What have I done? The second officer entered the residence and immediately observed the carnage. He saw one male subject lying on the floor wearing a black t-shirt, and black shorts. Underneath his head, there was a pool of blood from an apparent gunshot. He was later identified as 18-year-old Ethan Riley. Towards the back of the residence, a second male was observed lying on his back. He also appeared to have sustained a gunshot wound to the head. 
He was identified as 19-year-old Benjamin Blyick. The officer observed a revolver with a teal handle and gray finish on a table inside the residence. Ambulances arrived quickly, and both injured teenagers were transported to separate hospitals where they were listed in critical condition. The shooting suspect was identified as 17-year-old Friendswood resident Connor Hilton. It was his family's residence where the shootings transpired. Hilton was taken to the Friendswood Police Department for questioning. Upon arrival, officers immediately subjected Hilton to gunshot residue testing of his hands. While reviewing his social media accounts, police learned that just days earlier, Hilton posted an ominous picture of himself on Instagram with captioned lyrics from a rap song that read, Murder one, better run, or ya about to meet my gun. Killing plenty is so fun. At 38 minutes past midnight, Hilton was read his Miranda rights and agreed to speak without an attorney present. According to a probable cause affidavit, Hilton told Detective McCandless that earlier that evening, the two victims and a third friend arrived at his home together at his request. Hilton told the detective he possessed a handgun that he talked his mother into buying for him. The attorney representing Connor Hilton would later dispute this claim. In a published report by the Galveston County Daily News, authored by Michael A. Smith, attorney Jennifer Carpenter said in an email statement, Connor's mother did not purchase a gun for him. In Texas, making a firearm accessible to a child is categorized as a Class C misdemeanor. During the interview, Hilton made it clear to Detective McCandless that the reason he had the gun was to shoot someone and or himself. Hilton explained that all of his friends were in the main area of the residence when he began to show them the firearm. Authorities allege Hilton denied there was a prior altercation, disagreement, or anything any of the individuals did to provoke the shooting. Hilton went on to describe what happened inside the house. He said once he decided to shoot his three friends, he stood up, pointed the gun at Ethan Riley first, and pulled the trigger, shooting him in the left side of his head. Next, he turned to his right, pointed the firearm at Benjamin Blyick, and observed Blyick raise his hands defensively. Despite this, he shot Benjamin in the left side of his head. As far as a motive, officers allege Hilton admitted to Detective McCandless that he had long thought about and desired to kill a person. He simply wanted to know what it was like. Unbeknownst to his friends, the opportunity presented itself that evening. Hilton stated he fully understood what he had done and agreed he should be held liable. Hilton was initially charged with two counts of aggravated assault causing great bodily injury, while the district attorney's office said they were working on upgrading the charges. He was booked into the Galveston County Jail, and his bond was set at $600,000, which increased to $1 million the next day. Much to the chagrin of the victim's loved ones, Hilton was able to post bail, and he was released on Christmas Eve, in time to enjoy the Christmas holiday with his family. This did not sit well with the Friendswood Police Department, who took to social media to inform community members that the bond requirements did not include GPS monitoring or any conditions that provide extra security for the community given the violent actions of Hilton. Unfortunately for Hilton, this gift was subject to return. On Christmas Eve, it was reported with great sadness that Ethan Riley had passed away due to his injuries. Consequently, Hilton's charges were upgraded to murder. An arrest warrant was promptly issued, and in a display of force, officers swarmed his family's home on Christmas night with guns drawn. Friendswood police swarm the home of a 17-year-old, now murder suspect. Friendswood Police Department, we have a warrant. Come open the door now. Still no movement from inside the home. The officer gets back on the bullhorn. We have a warrant. Come to the door. Now. Make sure you have your hands in the air. Minutes later, the door opens, and Connor Hilton is walked out in handcuffs and arrested. Any comment? Hilton was arrested earlier this week after two men were shot on LaSalle Street where he lives. 
One of the victims, 18-year-old Eric Riley, died at the hospital, and the other victim is still in critical condition, according to police. Hilton was originally charged with two counts of aggravated assault, causing serious bodily injury. His bond was raised to $1 million, which he was able to post on Sunday, allowing him to spend Christmas with his family at home. That is, until officers showed up at his front door with a new warrant. Hilton is now charged with murder. He was taken to the Friendswood City Jail before he's going to be transferred to the Galveston County Jail. Soon after, a local ABC News affiliate tracked down some of Hilton's relatives. Family members showed up at his family's house today. Work with ABC 13 News. Are you Connor's parents? No, ma'am. Are you family members? We are. Any comment about this, these new charges? Uh, I don't know anything about any new charges. He was charged with murder. Okay, yeah. Any that's, comments on that? That's not me. No comment. No ma'am. What about his million dollar bond? Do family members plan to bail him out this Have time? No information on that, ma'am. Hilton now faces murder charges for the fatal shooting of 18 year old Ethan Riley. At the time of this upload, Hilton has been denied bail and remains in custody. Meanwhile, Benjamin Blyick is still hospitalized in critical condition. After Hilton's second arrest, his defense lawyers quickly filed several legal requests. One of these requests, submitted on December 27th, asks the court to exclude from the trial any statements that Hilton made to any law enforcement officer immediately following his arrest. In a separate motion filed on December 29th, Hilton's attorneys requested the court consider a bond of $500,000. Per online records, Hilton is scheduled to appear in court for a status conference on February 2nd at 8.30 a.m. The Hilton family issued the following statement to the media through their attorney. The parents of Connor Hilton cannot express enough their deepest condolences to the victims' families who have been heavily on the Hilton's hearts and minds as they try to navigate this devastating situation. Details about Ethan Riley and Benjamin Blyick are currently sparse in the public domain, as it is still very early in this case, with new developments unfolding daily. Blyick, who is critically ill, has a family that understandably has had limited interaction with the media, either due to not being reached or choosing to maintain their privacy during this challenging time. Consequently, they have not shared any public statements about the situation. On the other hand, Ethan's family set up a GoFundMe page to assist with funeral expenses, and the community rallied to ensure their significant goal was met within a matter of days. The individual who called 911 from the bathroom has not been publicly identified by authorities. Connor Lynn Hilton is a 17-year-old Texas resident born on September 14, 2006. He resides with his parents in a two-story, four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bathroom house in Friendswood's Mission Estates neighborhood, valued at around $400,000. Like many of his peers, he is fond of video games. He is also notably athletic, as seen on his Instagram page, which primarily showcases him performing backflips in various places. At one point, Hilton had a second Instagram account, which has since been deactivated. So far, there's no clear information regarding any past criminal activities, mental health issues, or substance abuse. However, there will undoubtedly be significant attention on his previously expressed desire to commit murder. His prior statements about wanting to own a gun to harm himself or others suggest potential mental health concerns that are likely to be a major focus in the upcoming trial, assuming there is no plea deal. This case raises numerous questions, legal and otherwise, highlighting the complexities of reporting on developing stories. Balancing the delivery of newsworthy cases with the availability of substantial information is always a challenge, and much remains uncertain in this situation. At first glance, the case against Connor Hilton might seem straightforward. There's a witness to the shootings, an alleged confession to the police, and forensic evidence ostensibly linking Hilton to the suspected murder weapon. Yet, legal proceedings are seldom straightforward. One key question is, were Ethan and Benjamin lured to Hilton's home for the purpose of being killed, or was it decided on a spur of the moment? Also, will the district attorney charge Hilton with capital murder? 
Despite his alleged incriminating statements, defense strategies in similar cases in the past have included claims of self-defense or diminished responsibility, arguing that the accused was not in a sound state of mind. Successfully arguing these points could potentially reduce the charges from murder to manslaughter, significantly impacting the potential prison sentence. Of course, Hilton's age is a crucial factor. In Texas, what is commonly referred to as first-degree murder is legally termed capital murder, a first-degree felony that can result in life imprisonment or the death penalty for adults. However, as a juvenile, Hilton is exempt from capital punishment. But suppose Hilton is tried as an adult. Well, under Section 12.31 of the Texas Penal Code, offenders under 18 convicted of capital murder will face an automatic life sentence with parole eligibility after 40 years. If tried within the juvenile justice system and convicted, he may receive a determinate sentence of up to 40 years. Furthermore, according to the Department of Justice, the overwhelming majority, 90 to 95 percent, of criminal cases result in plea bargaining. Therefore, the likelihood of that outcome should not be overlooked. As we follow the developments of this case, it's heartbreakingly clear that what started as a time of holiday cheer and small gathering of friends has tragically turned into a story of brutality, reportedly instigated by a troubled teenager against his own friends. The families of Ethan Riley and Benjamin Blyack, along with the local community, are holding on to hope that the Texas court system will deliver justice and closure, helping them to find some peace. Despite the darkness of this tragedy, the strength and the unity of the community offer a glimmer of hope and resilience in the face of adversity.